We are discussing Democratic 2024 presidential candidate aspirant Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s town hall event with News Nation last night, and we were just talking about his answers when asked about his stance on vaccines in general. So please be sure to watch that. That was the previous segment. But Kennedy was also asked to answer why he's running as a Democrat. Let's listen. Are you shocked by how you are being treated by the Democrats and their media? <laughs> Um, I'm not happy about it, um, but I'm, I'm not shocked. I know, you know, people get subsumed in orthodoxy. I think my, I believe that the values that I am trying to promote are the exact values that my father and my uncle would have promoted. And I've, you know, written books about my family. I've studied them. I have, uh, I, you know, the more that I've studied my family, the more I've written and researched them, my, my uncle and my father, the more proud I am of them. And I have uh, devoted my life to, uh, to promoting the same kind of values that I think they promoted. And I'm trying to, what my, one of my purposes in running is to remind the Democratic Party of you know, what we are supposed to represent and what we've always represented. And you know, people have said to me, why don't you run it as an independent? Why don't you? And I say, because I'm a Democrat. This is who I am. This is my identity. But I want my party back. I want my party to be what my, the party that I grew up in, the party of John Kennedy, the party of Robert Kennedy, the party of FDR and Harry Truman. So uh, at a certain point in, in this exchange, um, the moderator points out uh, that Donald Trump has said some favorable things about RFK Jr. And she asks, um, you know, I don't know if we're, we plan to play that. I think we're going to play that okay. next. All right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll wait on that for a second. So what did you make about this? Make yeah. This I, I mean, he's, uh, he, he, he speaks. I mean, this is why he is, is drawing some significant support in the Democratic nominating contest is because there still is out there in the real world a kind of Democrat who remembers fondly the people he mentioned, the people from his own family, and who I think believe in working class politics and maybe a different foreign policy and maybe, you know, more of a he's kind of emphasizing a live and let live philosophy and a lot of uh, a lot of issues um, that that resonates with uh, with. Uh, yes, with Americans in the Democratic Party. But you you hear from a specific contingent of the Democratic Party, the the elite, the the, the woke, you know, you know, you know who I'm describing, the, ma the mainstream media elite, the establishment elite that has a lot of power over the media and is probably are the people surrounding Joe Biden. And it speaks to an elite core of issues that are out of touch with not everyone in the Democratic Party. There's a lot of them, too, but people who don't have their voices represented and they like RFK Jr. Yeah, I think it is obviously true that there are two corporate parties and most uh, voters, most Americans are frustrated with that reality. Low voter participation rates are a reflection of uh, low government confidence, which you see reflected in polls. And the media is broadly out of touch with the core concerns of working class Americans. You have um, conservatives really positioning themselves as kind of anti-woke, framing their entire, people like Ron DeSantis framing their entire political agenda around, you know, a feud with Disneyland and Bud Light beer cans and things like that. And the Democratic Party, which has historically been the party that represented labor, made a shift, and RFK Jr. has talked about this, but made a shift in the 70s and 80s toward taking more corporate money, which had historically been the province of Republican politicians, and started to have more conservative economic policies as a consequence of that. So now you have two economically conservative parties that distinguish themselves solely on the basis of how they react to cultural issues. And so we've had a ratcheting up of the division around those cultural issues, taking relatively small poor, uh, populations like trans kids, of which there are only a few thousand and making them a national case so that no one is paying attention to the fact that their bank accounts are getting smaller, their dollar goes less far than it did before, the prices of housing, the price of housing has ballooned, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think there is some real um, legitimate nostalgia for yesteryear. I don't think it's necessarily that productive to just generally cast back into the past and say, mm -hmm. well, it was better that back then without talking about the fact that the tax rate for the rich was much higher 
corporate tax rate was much higher. We had much more robust funding to social programs, et cetera. There's a reason why things were better that back then for the average American. But I do think he's very right to tap into the feeling um, and again, not for all Americans, of course, but to the feeling that economically our policies were much more populist in the past. We want to play the next clip here. Moderator Elizabeth Vargas pressed Kennedy on the support he's receiving from major figures on the right, including Steve Bannon. Here's how he responded. My father was able to harness these populist energies. In the last day of his life, he won the most rural state in this country, South Dakota, and the most urban he was able to bridge the divide among people who would otherwise be Republican, but wanted somebody who was common sense, who was able to appeal to their idealism, who was able to find the hero in each of them, who was able to get them to transcend narrow self-interest and see themselves as part of a community and part of this you know, incredible American adventure in, in modeling self-governance for the rest of the world. And so I'm proud that President Trump likes me even though I don't agree with him on most of his issues. I'm, because I don't want to alienate people. I want to bring people together. I'm proud that all these people like me and that I have independent supporters and Democratic supporters and that I'm able to bring a lot of people. You know, every Democrat says, I want to end the polarization. But how do you do that without talking to people who don't agree with you? How do you do that without appealing to people? Without the per My purpose is to find the issues, the values that we have in common, rather than, you know, focus on the issues and the personalities but, that keep us all apart. Uh, I think, again, that goes to show that, I mean, it's just, he's practicing good politics there. And it's a reminder of like, what a disastrous candidate Hillary Clinton was, for example, the the deplorables yeah. comment. That's the opposite of the deplorable yeah. view that, you know, I need I need to win people of, of all, Ideological bents, races, creeds, and colors, and, and, and of all political sides. Uh, I mean, that's how Trump won in 2016, by peeling off some people who were otherwise Democrats and had voted for Democrats in the past and were not sold on Hillary Clinton, and she had done nothing to message to them. And they, they were Bernie curious, but, they, but Hillary was the candidate, and she didn't speak to them. And Trump won enough of them in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and a few other places to become the president. And then he didn't win them in 2020 yeah. because he didn't he didn't sell himself or they were turned off by the things he'd said or, or they were just drowned out by the other by the other people in the country reacting against him and voting for Biden. But uh, but it's just like good politics that you have to you, like you want everyone to be saying good things about you. Yeah, listen to how easy that is. I'm glad that Trump likes me even though I disagree with him. You've established mm -hmm. that you have basically an endorsement from someone who's very popular without tying yourself to any of his policy commitments and without disrespecting any of the people that like him. Now contrast that with what some of the players in the Republican field have been struggling with. They often will perhaps go too far in validating aspects of his agenda that actually aren't that politically popular and which are somewhat toxic. They will uh, be obsequious uh, and praise things that are not really policy related and don't need to be praised in a way that undermines their own credibility, especially now that they're running against him and, and doing a real heel turn the way that Chris Christie has on his views about Donald Trump. It is possible to come up with a response that respects the audience without diminishing your own integrity. And I think we just saw a really fantastic example of how to model a response to what do you do when someone who you don't like likes you back. He just simply didn't opine on his substantive feelings about Trump as a man out of respect, I believe, for an audience, many of whom like Trump, and instead said, look, we disagree on substantive policy issues. I don't agree with him, but it is a good thing that someone like, even someone like him, sees the value in somebody like me. Yeah, he he responded too to uh, to Elizabeth Vargas when she asked him, and I think this is a fair question. But he had a great answer. She said, "Well, you know, nobody in your family is even supporting mm -hmm. you." And he says, "Well, does everybody in your family agree with you?" And she and she laughed about. It. She said, "Well, no, of course yeah, not. Says, you we all have that, that experience. One. People disagree, even in their own families." Yeah, I mean, it is interesting that he keeps getting that question. Yeah, uh, it did feel, especially when he first announced that 
you know, the call went out and there were two prongs of attack that were going to come at him from the corporate media. One was you're an anti-vaxxer and two was that even your family doesn't like right. you. And I think the presumption was, well, let's diminish the value of the Kennedy name by lining all of the Kennedys up on one side that aren't him and say they don't like you. And then he's the lone Kennedy who's like not a real mm -hmm. Kennedy or something like that. I've noticed that this could be, I guess, selection bias from my standpoint. I've noticed that Democrats seem to love this tactic, mm. and I've never seen it that I can recall it being deployed by Republicans, like even against local officials. Sometimes somebody, you know, some local Republican and Democrats will run an ad saying, but his own brother and sister and twin and, you know, weird <laughs> uncle all say he's crazy and you shouldn't vote for him. I've never seen or maybe it's happened. I just can't recall it. It's something Democrats Yeah, I don't know. Like well, doing. I will say, sometimes I do think that there is some a little bit more meat behind it. I, and recently, obviously, there was the Herschel Walker debacle where his son came out in the context mm -hmm. of that campaign, making some very personal uh, accusations about their family dynamic, which may have negatively affected him in the, in right. the I think that's final stretch. a little stretch. bit different. Because um, it, felt, it felt more about character, mm -hmm. um, the allegations were the kinds of things that many people would consider to be disqualifying. Here, the allegation is your family doesn't agree with you on one narrow aspect of your life and your beliefs, but they still love you and embrace you and want to be with you right. at Thanksgiving dinner. The Herschel Walker situation Very was different. much more contentious <laughs> than Very that, different. right? Well, we've got one more clip to play from last night. Here's RFK Jr. on the U.S. budget and our priorities, our spending priorities, as well as war spending. We're sending $113 billion to the, to the uh, Ukraine. The, the entire budget of CDC is $12 billion. The budget of EPA is $12 billion. 57% well, of Americans could not put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency in their family. 25% of Americans are hungry. Oh, I have a friend who was on food stamps. He's a commercial fisherman. He's worked his entire life up to the work to the bone, created a business, gave it to his son-in-law. And he is he was injured. He's on permanent disability. He was getting food stamps, two hundred and eighty three dollars a month. And those food stamps are now worth a lot less because the inflation from paying for the wars uh, caused 76 percent rise in dairy, milk and eggs over the past two years. On March 1st. He got a, a robocall from the government saying that his food stamps are being cut by 90%. So he was getting 283 a month, which you can't feed yourself on $9 a day. He's now getting $23 a month, trying to feed himself on 80 cents a day. That same month, 30 million Americans got that call that month in March. Another 15 million had their Medicare cut. That same month, we spent, we printed $300 billion to bail out the Silicon Valley Bank, and we topped off Ukraine at $113 billion. Oh, we don't have, we have money, plenty of money for the big shots who need their bank bailouts and for any war that comes along. But if you took that $113 million, that billion that we've given to the Ukraine and spent it here, we wouldn't have to, sp to cut $1 from food stamps for that 30 million Americans. And we're acting like an alcoholic who's, you know, behind on his mortgage and he's taking the milk money and buying rounds for strangers at the bar. Yeah, I think that's a very powerful message, especially for the time period we're living in right now. Um, I, I think there's a lot of resentment among uh, certainly many Republicans, but probably many Democrats as well, that uh, that that the federal government finds no shortage of money, misplaced some money. Ukraine got a bonus. Oops. Yeah. Uh, for every every foreign policy venture, and you know, even the people we've had Republicans on the show who who will who will complain about spending and won't do anything about military spending, and he can actually make the case there that um, that so many Republicans can't sometimes because they don't actually want to they want to constrain social spending, but they don't want to constrain military spending. hundred percent. Many Democrats don't want to constrain either, and and he points out how they can be in tension with each other. A hundred percent. This is such a layup for any politician to grab the reins of. It's bizarre that more people haven't been using this exact framing. Now, 
I do think, to your point, some Republicans have been saying things like this, but they also don't want to expand domestic spending. There was a there was a series of viral tweets over the last day or two because a number of conservatives who voted against the infrastructure bill have been tweeting approvingly of money that is coming to their right. districts. And Democrats have been pointing out, oh, now you want to be here at the ribbon cutting, but you voted against this funding coming to your state in the first place. If you, as an, from an ideological perspective, oppose all domestic spending, as Republicans historically have, because the the basis of the ideological uh, the uh, the ideology in the party is to shrink government no matter what cost, you're going to be in a position where you have to How justify <laughs> you're going to have to I justify wish. cuts to very popular fun, uh, uh, policies like uh, Medicare and Social Security, which was the whole brouhaha over the last year right. uh, after the State of the Union. And you're also going to have to deal with the fact that you need those dollars coming to your state, that your citizens like them, whether it's military spending or infrastructure spending or whatever it is, those are jobs in your state. And the tension between Republicans talking about, I need more jobs, and I don't want there to be any domestic spending is really being exploited um, uh, well by RFK Jr. in this moment. Yeah. Well, we will continue to follow RFK Jr. and all the other candidates potentially for president in both sides of the uh, political aisle. We'll have more rising right after this.